I'm glad to be in church this morning. Had a fantastic Thanksgiving. Hope you did too. One of my favorite holidays, I mean probably my favorite because there's no gifts. It's just food and hanging out with family. And I don't know who you got to spend time with this year, but I had a great Thursday. Got to spend time with my family. Friday, got to spend time with my wife's family. And here's what I noticed. Thursday, after we got done eating, we just kept hanging out. We just enjoyed being in each other's presence. You know what I'm saying? We just loved being around each other. After the food was put away, we, we, we pulled out some board games and we had a blast. And then it seemed like, man, before you knew it, it was 10 o'clock and the kids had to go to bed and the adults stayed up and we'd have coffee and snacks and our third dessert of the day, you know, because we just loved spending time with each other. The next morning I got up and my wife's family, they celebrate on Friday because there's so much family in town and we got to go over there and we got family pictures and then we had lunch. And before you know it, we're snacking between lunch and dinner and we're hanging out at dinner and the girls are going and hanging out and playing games. And it was just such a good time. And yesterday my, my, my brother-in-laws, they left and headed home. And it's always so hard because we love spending time with family. It's hard saying goodbye when my cousins leave town to go back to wherever they're at these days. Because there's nothing like spending time in somebody's presence that you truly care about and appreciate. Am I right? And there's something I noticed at the Thanksgiving table. My phone stayed in my pocket. Because I haven't seen them in a while and I want to talk to them and I want to hear everything they're saying. And even in my pocket, I'd hear a buzz or something would go on. I usually try to check my email. I wasn't concerned with that. It's funny when you want to be with somebody how even distractions that usually easily distract you get put aside because you want to be in their presence. That's what I want to talk to you about today. I shared uh, through email with a lot of you guys that this weekend would be very, very practical, because as we've gone through this encounter series, we've read about people who had a one-time extraordinary, incredible encounter with God, and it was something else. But a lot of us We're not like that. We're not a Moses who has a burning bush to point back to. We're not a Saul on our way to to persecute the church and Jesus appears in the sky and starts talking. That didn't happen to us. A lot of us were more like the guy that I want to talk to you about today. It's not a one-time big experience where we have goosebumps all over our body. It's more of an every day, every week, year in, year out encounter with Jesus. And can I be honest with you? This is the relationship God wants with you. Boy, I love my family, but can you imagine if I only spoke to them at Thanksgiving? Can you imagine if I told them that was the only time I wanted to hang out with them? No, Thanksgiving is an overflow because I love spending time with them. And when I have a chance, if they're in town, we're going to have dinner. We're going to spend time with them because we love them. That's the relationship God longs to have with you. And so this morning, I want us to talk about how we can have an encounter with God. We're going to read about the life of David. And David, unlike Moses, unlike all these different individuals in the Old Testament, you think of Hannah who had an experience with that. You think of all these different people who had this one-time experience with God. David had multiple encounters with God that changed his life and kept him on course. And as a matter of fact, he was so close to God that later in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, Paul would write about David. He would say, David was a man after God's own heart. That's how incredibly close he was to God. He longed to have God's heart, to be close to God. And it's no surprise because in 1 Samuel chapter 13, I want to read to you what God had to say about him. When he was about to be anointed by Samuel, read with me in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14. He says, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Samuel talking to Saul says, your reign is about to end because God is not concerned with how many victories you have in battle. God is not concerned with how tall you are. Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. He was a man's man, a leader's leader. And Samuel said, Saul, God is not looking for that. I have good news for you this morning. God is not interested in your accolades, your accomplishments, how much money you have, the things you've done, how you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. God is interested in someone after his own heart, someone who wants to be close to God. And the Lord has commanded him. The Lord is calling him, and he's going to use him to lead his people. Paul said of David, he would be a man after his own heart. He was known as that because that's what God was looking for. And so first of all, we see that God desires our heart. 
I want you to understand this this morning. God doesn't just want you to have an encounter where your head explodes. Like, whoa, that was crazy. God doesn't just want you to have an encounter where for the rest of your life you hold on to head knowledge and say, I believe this and this is true. He wants you in a way that is deeper than just head knowledge, deeper than just what you remember. He wants your heart and your heart goes beyond your head. Your heart is when you hold on even when, it shouldn't, when you shouldn't hold on, even when you believe when it doesn't look like you should believe, even when you love when it seems like there is no love. This is the heart that God is after. Most of us in the room know there is somebody that we love deeply who, for whatever reason, and has hurt us. For whatever reason, it's almost like they don't even deserve our love, but we love them. Why? Because they're our child. Why? Because they're our family, because they're our blood, because we've known them our entire life. Love, the heart, goes so much deeper than the head. And I want you as a church, I want you to know God's word. Hear me out, Christian. I want you to know the word, but I want you to understand God desires your heart. He wants your heart, and that's what he had with David. He had his heart. He had his heart, and it was closely wound. Notice in what Samuel said in verse 13 of chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, something happens to David. It says, then Samuel took the horn of oil. He's now selected David. They've realized this is the man after God's own heart. In the midst of his brothers, his brothers who are more talented, more qualified, and the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. From that day forward, David was in a relationship with God, had the presence of God. So the second thing we need to understand about God's presence is that we need God's presence to accomplish anything of substance. Can I remind you that David had already done some pretty incredible things? He had ripped a bear in two with it. I mean, he was just incredible when he was protecting the sheep. He had fought a lion. He had done incredible things. But from this day forward, he had the spirit of the Lord. Can I tell you something? You can do a whole lot in your own power. But if you want to do something that lasts, something of substance, you need God's presence in your life. I'm not knocking what you've done to this point. I'm not knocking what you've accomplished. That is incredible. That's way to go. I'm so happy for you. But I want you to be reminded that anything we accomplish apart from God, it, it'll burn up. It won't last. You, you might get 80, 90. You might live to be 100 on this earth. But if everything you do is for yourself and for money and fame and success and power and sex and pleasure, whatever, it's gone. It's fleeting. David wasn't just interested in being a king. David wasn't just interested in getting power. He was interested in doing something that would last. And it is through his line that a savior was born. It is through his line that Jesus came into the world. David always realized it was the long game, not right now. And if you're here this morning and you want to do something that matters, you want to do something your life because God's presence begins to reveal to us, this is not important. I'm not saying to quit your day job, guys. We got to pay bills, but don't allow your job. Don't allow money. Don't allow your home. Don't allow what the world tells us we need to have fun to have, be happy. Don't allow those things to become the primary source of your life's goal. That is not why you are here. You are not here just to have a few nice vacations, to live in a pretty nice house, to drive some new cars from time to time. You get to the end of your life, and that's all you've done. You have a life that is filled with receipts that you have not contributed in any way. You've just purchased, you've bought, you've enjoyed. And by the way, I have a car, I have a house, I'm going to go on vacation. These things happen. But these are not what we live for, what we strive for. This is not what we exist to accomplish. We're here to do more than that. But then what we really see is that, yes, David had God's presence, and yes, he was a man after God's own heart. And I would dare say that most of us, we, we would say that, I want to be with him. And like David, it's presence. But here's the difference between David and Saul. Here's the difference between David and most of us in this room, myself included. David didn't just desire God's heart. He didn't just enjoy God's presence. He prioritized his time with God. So here's what I want us to do this morning. I want to be as practical as I can for everyone in the house. I want to show you what David did, why it worked, 
and how we can model that in our busy, hectic, crazy lives. No, David didn't have Twitter, but he had the whole world at his disposal, and that got him into trouble more than once. No, David didn't have the distractions of notifications coming through on his phone. He didn't have maybe as busy a calendar as you did, but he did have many people wanting his attention at all times, and David found a way to prioritize his time with God. So my first question when we get into this right now is this. Have you been prioritizing your time with God? Look, when it's Thanksgiving, there's nowhere else I'm going to be than at that table. You know what I'm saying? I love dark meat turkey, and I'm going to eat it all if I get a chance. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be, what time is it? I'm going to be there 30 minutes early. You know why? Because I don't want other people snacking on the stuff that I could be snacking on. I'm going to get there, and I'm going to start eating because I love Thanksgiving. You know why I also love being there? Because this is the only time I get to spend with some of my family that's in town. I prioritize it, right? Let me tell you something. It's really easy for some of us to prioritize Sunday. That's like the Thanksgiving, the weekly get together. You know what I mean? It's a little harder for us to prioritize the everyday, right? The phone call to mom, the text to your parents, the text to your, to your loved one, the text to your wife, fellas, amen? You know, I know we don't do it enough. The everyday is where it's at. We've gotten good as a, as a society at prioritizing the big events, the Super Bowls, the big games, the one times, because it's easy to commit to one thing every once in a while. It's so much harder to commit to daily time with somebody, to your goal, to your priority, whatever, to God. So David prioritized his time with God in a couple of different ways. Look, number one, he prioritized and he loved God's house. Read with me Psalm 27 and verse four. And I want you to hear the way that David describes his love for God's house. One thing have I asked of the Lord. I would remind you at this point, he's the king got all the gold, got all the silver. He's realized everything is vanity. There comes a point where money's just money and you've already got it and it doesn't matter. There comes a point where you realize you're so blessed, you don't need it anymore. By the way, can I remind us as Americans, a lot of us ate way more than we needed on Thursday and there's people around the world who didn't get enough to eat. We are blessed, blessed. He said, one thing will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He said, God, I have found everything else to be wanting. I want time with you to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. There is gonna come a day for you. Maybe it's in your 20s, your 30s, where you realize like, I know how to make money. I know how to get by. I know how to pay my bills. And that's not where happiness and satisfaction is. I've got friends. I've got things. I get to do nice things. I get to own nice things. But that is not where satisfaction lies. And you realize that even having all of these things the world tells us we need, there is something we, our heart longs for and desires for. It is a relationship with God. But more than that, it's a knowledge of God. It's an understanding of him. It's kind of like when you're in a dating relationship, that first awkward date where you're getting to know each other. All of us, the problem we have is that we keep starting over with an awkward date with God because we never get past the first date. We never get to know God. We never get to spend time with God. We never set aside time to spend with him. And he longs for our hearts. And David, he said, this is my desire to be in the house of God. So not only did he love God's house, which I believe, by the way, should be like step one. Like it should be pretty understanding. If we're a believer, we should want to be in God's house, growing and learning. But he also loved God's word. Read what David said in Psalm chapter 19 about God's word and about God's law. Psalm chapter 19, beginning in verse seven, he describes it this way. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. It it gives me life. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise Making wise the simple, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. He says, it has opened my eyes. It has given life to my soul. God's word is good and I need it. I need it in my heart. I need it in my daily life. He prioritized God's house when he loved God's house. He loved God's word, but he also loved God's presence. Consider what he said in Psalm chapter 55 about his time with God and how sweet it was and how regular it was. Psalm chapter 55, verse 16 says, but I will call to the Lord and the Lord will save me. Evening, morning, and noon, three times a day. He said, if I'm putting food in my mouth three times a day, I need to spend time with God three times a day. I will utter my complaint. And some of y'all just said, whoa, 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 we don't complain to God. You don't know God as well as David did. They're close. See, a lot of us, we still have this television version of prayer in our life where we just ask God for stuff, where we just say, God, be with so-and-so and so-and-so. And you don't, that's not somebody who knows each other. When I run into friends, the first thing they ask me is not, can I give them something? The next thing they tell me is, you need to pray for so-and-so. No, they ask me how I'm doing. They tell me about their day. 
You tell them about their hopes, their dreams, their goals. Some of, you, some of us have never talked to God this deeply. He says, on my complaint and my moan, he says, I'm crying to God. I am pouring out my soul in front of God. Morning, noon, and evening. What David loved God's presence. Now, when we read all that, it kind of hits us right in the gut. It hits me. Because we say, I'm not spending that kind of time with God. And maybe we come up with some excuses. Well, if I was the king, I'd make time. I would remind you, kings are pretty busy. It was probably pretty difficult for David to tell his advisors, his leaders, this time, I'm not meeting with you. I'm not meeting with all the king's men. I'm not meeting with anybody. This is my time for God. But we could get so much more done, David. Don't you see? And he said, don't you understand? It's not how much I accomplish here. It's my relationship with God that is going to keep me humble. Keep me following his will, not mine. And by the way, on more than one occasion, David strayed from God's way. King Saul was a good king at first. He was humble. He was honorable. He was a good man, the Bible says. But pride began to take root in his heart. And Samuel, the prophet, approached him about his pride and said, this is going to derail you. And Saul said, forget you. I don't need you. God's already put me on this pedestal. He's not going to knock me off. And he refused to repent. So let's, let's be judged just for a second. Wouldn't you say that pride's a pretty bad thing? Can I remind you what David did? David slept with a man's wife, killed that man, murdered him, hid it. I think most of us, if we were God, we'd say Saul is the better person here, not David. This is not a man after my own heart. But here's the difference between the two. When Nathan, the prophet, approached David, David repented and cried and wept. God's not looking for perfect people who are after his own heart. He's looking for humble people who are after his heart. Who, when you're confronted with sin, when you, by the way, if you spend time in God's word, you will be confronted with your sin. It's very easy for us as Christians to say, they're doing sin, and he's doing sin, and she's doing sin, until we read the word and say, whoa, I'm, I'm kind of messed up too. Not kind of, I am. So, how can we have an encounter with God the way that David did? This holiday season, I want to share with you three ways to encounter God the way that David encountered God. Can I remind you, the next four weeks are gonna be crazy. Some of you have already been out shopping. You've seen the videos. People are in a headlock getting a toy. You know what I'm saying? It's bananas out there. You're not gonna find me out there on a Friday. No, sir. People seem to be a lot nicer on Cyber Monday because they're not in my house. It's just me and my computer. <laughs> we gotta keep this safe, y'all. I'm scared to go out. Look, it's crazy. You're gonna be bombarded with requests, parties, this and that. You're going to have a hundred things to do over the next four weeks. And if you and I am not careful, we are going to put our time with God down the list because we've got to get so much done. And it's so comical to me that if we aren't careful, the church will get so busy looking to celebrate the birth of a Savior that we as Christians won't spend time with that Savior the way that we should. What an indictment upon us. If his birth is worth celebrating, there's, there should be time with him in the morning, at noon, and at night as David did. So let's talk about how we can make sure that we have an encounter with God this holiday season. Number one, we need to do what David did. We need to prioritize God's house. It's a big deal to be at church. It's a big deal to be here. And I know you're saying, Pastor Mark, you're just saying that because you're always here. I am always here. But I was here when I was a kid, too. I grew up. I understand why we go to church. Over the next four Sundays, we're going to start a Christmas series. You guys will notice these cards out on your way out of church this morning. You've got invite cards that you can invite somebody to church with. And you can say, I'm going to be at every one of these four services because we're going to be talking about God with us. The word Emmanuel, Jesus isn't just God. He's God with us. You understand that God doesn't want to just watch you go through something. He wants to be with you in the valley, with you in the struggle, with you when you feel lost, with you when you feel all alone. This Christmas, we're going to be focusing on the fact that God is with us. And I'm going to tell you something. A lot of the people in your neighborhood, in your family, in your network, they need to know that God is with them. They need to know that God loves them. 
that they are not alone even though they feel like they are. Prioritize God's house. Make it a habit. It is a good thing for your children to see you going to church regularly and bring them to kids' worship where they'll learn about Jesus and about a relationship with him. Number two, don't just prioritize God's house. Prioritize his word. Prioritize your time in God's word. First of all, by reading it, okay? You gotta read it. You gotta spend time in it. You gotta read what God's word is. All of us wanna be like Moses and have this burning bush experience. There was no Bible yet. There was no scripture We have so much more than Moses ever had at his disposal. We have the word of God. Don't just read it, hear it. We live in a crazy world right now. I can pull up the Bible app, the free app on my phone. I can select a chapter and I can press play and I can select a version out of hundreds of versions, press play and it'll start playing in my ear. At work last week, I was listening to a couple of passages in Mark. I think it was like seven chapters in Mark and I started noticing a theme because when you read it, you can only read so much but when you hear it, you can listen to lots of it and I was listening to it and listening to it and I noticed this theme. There were these miracles that Jesus did where he would feed these people and at the end there would be baskets to take up. So they would start out with a little knapsack of food, Jesus would feed all these people. And at the end, his disciples who were doubters would have to carry out these huge baskets of blessings. You know what I'm saying? They started with this much and they're having to walk this much. And I told my wife, I said, I I don't know what it is, but the more I listened to that all the way through, I noticed this theme, like they didn't have faith. They didn't think it was enough. And God blessed them with baskets. And I said, woe is me. Like I have been living in a knapsack mentality when I have a God who wants to give us baskets of blessings. God is able to do so much more than we think or ask sometimes. Just a thought I had listening to God's word. Read it, hear it. Hey, but don't just read it and hear it. Follow it. When God's word reveals to me that there is sin in my heart, there is bitterness in my soul, there is unforgiveness, there is hate, anger, something that I need to repent of, I need to deal with it, and I need to follow his way, not mine. When he says, turn the other cheek, and I'm just as guilty of cussing them out as they are of cussing me out, I need to learn to turn the other cheek. When he says, love your enemies, pray for your enemies, and I'm over here spreading rumors about my enemies, I need to acknowledge, God, I am wrong. I need your forgiveness. These are encounters with God that we will not have if we're not reading his word and hearing his word. So like David, we need to prioritize God's house, prioritize his word, but then prioritize his presence. And this goes deeper than just reading. I'm afraid a lot of us as Christians have got good at the Bible reading part. I'm going to read and we'll read four chapters. We'll read five chapters and we'll say, I read all of this and good job. But I want to ask you, did you have time in the presence of God? This is spending time in prayer where we're not reading. We're not going through a bullet list. We're not accomplishing some goal. We're saying, God, I need some time with you. Here's what I've found about spending time with God, prioritizing his presence. It doesn't just happen. First of all, you got to put it on a calendar. I know I'm speaking my language. I may not be speaking your language, but look, stuff doesn't happen if it doesn't get put on my calendar. I got to pull my phone out and say, I'm putting it on now. Some of us, we run into people like, oh man, how you been? By the way, if I ever run into you and I'm like, yeah, we need to get up sometime. If I don't pull my phone out, we're not getting up (laughs) sometime, anytime. It's not happening. Because if I don't put it on the calendar, it's not going to just, hey, here we are. No, you've got to put it on the calendar. Some of us, our first problem with having God's presence in our life is we have not sat down. We feel so rushed all the time. We need to sit down on a Sunday night and say, this is what my week looks like. And on Monday, this is my 15 minutes with God. I'm going to turn the notifications off on my phone. I'm going to turn everything down. Because some of us here, we've been reading our Bible on our phone and we haven't turned notifications off. And guess who gets a text right when they start reading the word? Turn notifications off, go into airplane mode and read God's word or pull out a physical copy of God's word. I don't care if you use a Bible or a phone, but read God's word. Spend some time in it. Put it on the calendar. Don't assume that a year from now, you'll be a super Christian if you don't put it on your calendar to begin doing these things and begin reading his word. Number two, hey, you want to prioritize your your time with God in his presence? Don't rush it. Can you imagine if I showed up at Thanksgiving, sat down across from my family and said, all right, let's eat. I got somewhere to be. I got places to go and people to talk to. I love y'all, but you get 20 minutes. That's all you get. How was your week? How was your month? How are things going? Good, good, good. Let's go. Look, if I'm family, I'm like, who is this? What are you talking about? I want to spend time with you. 
I want us to relax back, you know, re- lean back in our chairs, grab some coffee with dessert, talk about this, talk about that. We got nowhere to go and nowhere to be. And then we treat God like this appointment we've just got to squeeze in. Don't rush it. My third encouragement, if you're going to prioritize God's presence, you've got to make it enjoyable. Some of us have decided that being a Christian should be awful, it should be painful, it should be so hard. I don't see that in David's life. David loved spending time with God. I got some encouragement years ago, and I've shared it in Life Track since then. Some of us, our problem is we try to make Bible reading and prayer this hard thing that we have to do, so we get in an uncomfortable position, maybe on our knees, and we do it, and we make it difficult. No. Find your most favorite place to sit in your house. Find your most favorite place to be alone, with maybe with your favorite cup of coffee. Make it something you look forward to going to. When you're going on a first date with somebody, when you're spending time with your wife, when you're spending time with somebody you love, you don't say, let's find the most uncomfortable place to sit. Let's drink some awful things, whatever it is that's just nasty and we don't like. Let's make it difficult, awful, and something we don't look forward to, but at least we'll be together, amen? No, that's not how we spend time with God. When I spend time with God, I'm going to tell you, I have coffee because I like coffee. And I'm sitting in my favorite spot. It's my back porch because I like being on my back porch. It's the only place my dogs don't bark the whole time, okay? So I love being out there. I got no distractions. It's just me and God. And I like praying in my backyard because I can walk around in circles. Some people, like I got neighbors that can see my backyard. They probably think I'm crazy. I walk around in my backyard and I just talk with God. You know why? Because there ain't nobody back there. There's nobody distracting me. There's nobody that can bump into the office and say, hey, what's up? It's just me and God, and a beware of dog sign to keep people out of my yard. You know what I'm saying? I got time with God. Some of us could be so close to God that we haven't sat down and figured out, how can I put this on the calendar? How can I make sure I put enough time in where I don't have to rush? And how can I make it enjoyable? Maybe you've got a favorite chair. Maybe you've got a favorite rocking chair on your porch. Maybe it's a place you like going in your car on your way to work. You leave a little early, and you get there, and you watch the sun come up if you get up that early. Or you've got a spot where you can just watch the busyness of the city, but be a little separated from it. Maybe it's at the top of your parking garage where you already park. Or you can be alone, watch the morning get started, and spend some time with God. Maybe you're a night owl, and after the kids go to bed and everything's quiet in the house, you can sit on the sofa, maybe start a fire now that it's winter, and say, God, I I need some time with you. I need some time in your presence. And you just open your heart and you say, God, I'm hurting. This is going to be a hard Christmas. God, my marriage is not what I I think it should be. And I know I'm at fault. So I need you to show me where I'm falling apart. Show me where I'm, I'm in need spiritually. Show me where I can be the husband, be the wife that I need to be, God. You and I are not naturally prone to just being close to God. It takes habits. It takes rhythms. It takes prioritizing this time that we have and making God at the top of our priorities. So I have one question for you, and I'm done. How will you prioritize God, this busy, crazy, expensive holiday season?